Once, long ago, a network of arteries was etched into the earth, a vibrant passageway for trade, along which goods, people, and culture flowed, spanning 8,000 kilometers over land and sea. This was the old Silk Road. For the past nine months, I've been on a journey of breathtaking beauty, east to west. It's a real attack on all your senses, really. To retrace the ancient corridors of commerce forged some 2,000 years ago. From silk farms in China to Turkey's olive groves, these historic hubs of trade have not only survived, but indeed thrived. Now centers of innovation and modern exchange. When can we see something like this? This now is possible. Finally, our journey ends here. In a region made rich by its maritime past, we explore the technology keeping it afloat, an industry still spinning a profit, and celebrate the ultimate incarnation of an ancient marketplace. This month, we reach the city of water, Venice, and venture into Italy. It's known as the Floating City. Founded on a lagoon off the north coast of Italy and strategically situated on the shores of the Adriatic Sea, Venice was once a gateway for trade between east and west. A lot of years ago, a lot of years, means 800 years ago, the only income was by the goods, by the custom of the goods. Everything passing through here paid a 30, 40, 50 percent to Venice just to pass through. And with that money, we came so rich. What was traded here a long time ago? Everything coming from the East. So uh, could be the spices, could be the salt, could be uh, the silk, could be fireworks, spaghetti. It was also the Venetian merchants who sourced goods as exotic as these. Venturing East along the Silk Road, they crossed into Central Asia, traveling as far as China before returning home with treasures to trade. Perhaps the most famous Venetian explorers was the man who lived behind those walls, Marco Polo. His travels lasted more than two decades, and his account of those experiences, that of legend. His tales from faraway lands sparked a fascination with the East, encouraging more trade and communication, and strengthening the Venetian Republic's maritime might. Today, Arsenale, once the epicenter of this naval power, still stands. L'Arsenale di Venezia è il luogo dove venivano costruite le navi. The Arsenale in Venice was a place where vessels were built for trade, as well as to defend the city. It started small and grew slowly from the end of the 12th century, growing steadily until it became one of the largest shipyards by the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century. Within these walls, much of the city's economic wealth and power was built. At its peak, there was enough manpower to produce a ship a day. In quel periodo si diceva che potevano lavorare in arsenale. It is said that 10,000 men could be found working at the shipyard, and there are about 1,500 carpenters in charge of building the ships. These figures give an idea of the scope, magnitude, and work done here at the shipyard during the 16th century. Despite its maritime prowess, living on a lagoon poses a set of unique problems for this city. Its very beauty, its crowning glory, the water that surrounds it has been its biggest challenge. Here, high tides known as aqua alta are a part of life in Venice. But come winter, wind-driven, exceptionally high waters cause the canals to creep into the far corners of the city, flooding places like the famed 
Piazza San Marco. Last year, the tide exceeded 110 centimeters seven times. While business is closed for some, others have adapted. At Libreria Aqua Alta, bathtubs and gondolas protect the books from rising water. All right, this morning came high water, so the, the books and the bath, they saved. How difficult is it to run a business like this? Go used to, so we, so we know how to do it. Yeah. He's already it's half a meter up. In 1966, an aqua altar of almost two meters quite literally put the city under water. It was the worst flood in Venice's history, leaving 5,000 people homeless. With the added threat of rising sea levels, engineers decided the only way to keep out the high tides was to create a man-made barrier. And so Mose, a reference to the biblical character Moses, who could part water, was born. It was an idea proposed in 1988, but it took 15 years to break ground. Spread across three inlet points, 27 concrete foundations have been fixed to the lagoon floor and fitted with gates that are opened and closed during exceptionally high tides. Symbolically situated alongside Venice's once glorious shipyards is the Mose Control Room, now a center for technological excellence and innovation. Here, engineers have been monitoring the conditions of the lagoon since 2011 in anticipation of the day Mose is fully complete. Wow, look at this. This is where everything is controlled. The gates are raised according to Archimedes' principle, something discovered over 2,000 years ago. The innovation lies in combining ancient physics principles with cutting-edge technology. It's a long-term project Monica Ambrosini has followed for years. Hello. Hello. Buongiorno. Hi, Monica. Hi. It's Nima. Nice to meet Very you. Very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for taking us out. You're welcome. It's a foggy day. I'm sorry for the weather. <laughs> Work is expected to take another two more years, but already 85% of the barriers have been installed. So we're over the gates right now? Yes, we are in the northern canal of the Lido Inlet and here under the water at minus six meters there are the 21 gates already installed. When a tide comes we put air inside the gates so they float to stop the entrance of the high tide inside the lagoon. Why was it important to have this under the sea and not a permanent barrier, not a permanent structure like other countries have done? Yes, it was a request of the Italian state because they said that we couldn't make interference on the navigation. Uh, the inlet are the entrances to the main harbour. Standing side by side like dominoes, the barriers are designed to protect Venice and the businesses it runs for a century a pioneering feat of Italian technology. You know, you've got a lot of countries looking at what's happening here in Venice. Can this technology be emulated elsewhere? Yes, a lot of countries are interested, for example, in Jakarta or uh, New York City is looking at this because they think that this system can be used in case of uh, flooding. These uh, floating gates can be uh, a chance for many parts in, uh, in the world. Here in Venice, the sea is a way of life. It is a place whose wealth was built on the economy of the harbour and the traffic of ships and trade. With revolutionary technology, Venice has finally found a solution to take advantage of the sea once more. By sharing its knowledge and information with the global community, these shores are now paving a new modern Silk Road.
Silk, one of the oldest fibres known to man, a shimmering thread of unparalleled grandeur. Some 2,000 years ago, Chinese merchants traded this precious commodity westwards, forging the Old Silk Road, an ancient network of passageways over land and sea. Yet the origins of silk were shrouded in mystery, a secret carefully guarded by China for centuries. Only once the silkworms and their eggs were smuggled out did the knowledge of cultivating silk reach this European town. Italy's silk industry began as early as the 12th century when cities in the north began exporting silk across Europe to satisfy the increasing demand from the rich and the powerful. And today, Como remains at the center of silk production. Nestled in the north of Italy, Lake Como is known as a city of silk. Thanks to the presence of the right climate, the right temperature, the silkworm breeding was possible thanks also to the presence of the cultivation of mulberry trees. Leaves from this tree is the only food that those little silkworms want to eat. By the late 1800s, Como was outputting 60,000 tons of cocoons a year. But with the onset of the two world wars, the pride of an entire country was interrupted and dismantled. At a certain point, after the Second World War, it became cheaper and cheaper to import from China. Unable to compete with more competitive prices, Italian spinning mills were forced to shut down. Yet, Como endured. Even if we don't produce any more the yarn, because we import it, what remains in Como is the rest of the story. So Como remains today the unique place in the world where you have a very high, high level of production. I mean, you sell to Mrs. Obama, for example, or Kate Middleton, but you sell also for the most expensive market you can think, for tapestry, the big villas, but especially for fashion collection. Today, Como produces 85% of Italian silk and around 70% of the silk used in Europe. For over a century, the family-run business of Mantero has been one such company that weaves and prints and designs silk that is then sent all over the world. Here, silk production is an artwork, a craft carefully perfected for generations. Using both traditional and newer printing techniques, Montero supplies the world's best, including brands like Valentino and Salvatore Faragamo. I have to say, I never expected to see such a massive silk production house here in Italy. What's the process? How does this work? Everything starts from the yarns from China. Then there is the process of the weaving that we make in Italy. And then that's the printing phase that actually starts. The color is spread on the screen and then the fabric should be dried and then it starts the second screen uh, with a different color. Using age-old methods like these, one scarf can take up to six months to create. It's a labor of love that Franco Mantero believes is still crucial to their success. It's a kind of uh, migration from the uh, traditional printing to the digital printing for a reason of timing and for a reason of cost. The real uh, challenge for us is to continue using the traditional printing at the same time of the digital printing, but to produce something different. But it's not just printing differently. To rejuvenate the industry, they're thinking of growing silk once more. The silk that we see here is 98%. Uh, the yarn is made in China. But we have the, the right climate, uh, we have also the right uh, territory to do that. Probably we cannot uh, change the world uh, in, this, uh, in this way, but uh, uh, we can do something uh, new going back to the past. An Italian company, Dorca, is doing just that. Interwoven with gold, their artisanal jewels use silk spun from locally grown worms. 
This could be the future, a way to remain competitive on the catwalk, to proudly boast not just made in Italy, but grown in Italy. It may not yet compare to the silk production of China, but for a company like Mantero, these yarns might one day be spinning a new silk road. I've been on a journey through Italy, once an ancient epicenter for trade along the old Silk Road. Today, this is a place that still prospers. I've navigated Venice's waters to witness the Italian technology turning the tide and protecting the historical lagoon from floods. And traveled to Lake Cuomo, the city of Silk, to learn about the renaissance of their textile production. Finally, I've reached Milan, the business capital of Italy. It's known as Expo. Every five years, nations of the world from east to west gather together to hold a World Fair, an international exposition to share knowledge and ideas. Algi panna cotta, is this really the food of the future? Better be good. <laughs> Today, it's grown, now spread over one million square meters. And for the second time, Milan has played host. Ten floors, but an amazing view, I have to say. This place is so massive, so we're in a buggy just to make sure we get to see everything. Every day, some 250,000 people have been coming here, and it's been going on for about six months. The reason for the expo in the beginning was really, you know, to bring the world in a place and have the inhabitants of that place being exposed to the opportunity to learn about the world. 140 nations are here to participate. Laid out country by country, there are 54 self-built pavilions, each an opportunity to boast products, culture and ideas. A lot of visitors come into the World Expo and we think it is a good platform for us to be exposed to the international uh, uh, stage to just uh, let uh, people from uh, different parts of the world to know China more. The centerpiece in the Chinese pavilion is this, an art installation representing the wheat fields of China. And when you're here seeing all these people sharing ideas, sharing knowledge, it really feels like a modern day reincarnation of the old Silk Road. Spanning 8,000 kilometers over land and sea, the Silk Road was an ancient marketplace, a network of passageways connecting east to west. Just think about the uh, concepts behind the Silk Road. And we tried to create, uh, to create exactly the same feeling in here. So getting people together, getting populations together, push on innovation, creating uh, some sharing conditions of experiences, facilitating trade, and actually plan the basis for future economic development. And nothing brings people together better than food. A place like Italy is famed for its traditional cuisine, but the theme for this expo is about the future. In years to come, Marco Pedroni believes this is how we'll shop. Noi abbiamo immaginato con questo supermercato del futuro in Expo due idee fondamentali. We've conceived two ideas with this supermarket of the future. That the supermarket will once again be an open square, a meeting place not just for goods, but also a place for people to talk and trade in. In this supermarket, the stalls are low to recreate a square where you can see all the people and goods within it. Tutte le persone e tutte le merci che sono nel supermercato. The second idea is greater transparency in food, with more information for the consumers. We have tested this idea of improved labels where you have more information than what you'd usually find on the regular paper labels that are printed on packaging. When can we see something like this? This now is possible. For example, for example, the information on this label is where you'll find the price, the allergens and the place of origin for every single raw ingredient. 
In the market of tomorrow, nutritional advice and the carbon footprint of the food we buy will be at our fingertips. But at the Expo, it's not just about consuming food. It's also about innovative ways of producing food. Algae are everywhere. Like in, in every city, in every pond, river, canal, you find different type of algae. So they are a resource that is present everywhere, but that we currently are not exploiting. Integrating technology with nature. This is the world's first urban algae canopy, providing shade, the equivalent of 25 trees worth of oxygen, and an unusual but viable source of food. Growing population, access to meat, to animal protein is going to become more and more expensive, more and more difficult, and often not very high quality. So what algae offer is an alternative to that. It's a new stream of nutrients, of vegetable protein, which are completely sustainable and they are grown within the city. A petri dish like this has the same amount of protein as one steak. Algae panna cotta, is this really the food of the future? I believe so, that's why I actually prepared it for you to have a go. Right, let's give it a shot. It's a good, it's a good spot to start from. Oh, I don't know. Better be good. <laughs> Very strong, but very, very nice. <laughs> I can see myself eating this. An acquired taste, perhaps, but this could be one step towards a larger vision for the future of our food. Nine months ago, I embarked on a journey from China following the ancient Silk Road. It has been a remarkable voyage that has finally reached an end. From e-commerce in India to soap operas in Turkey, I've learned about silk, and spices, tourism, and trains. To me, the Silk Road is so much more than just a route. It embodies international trade and business, a channel for sharing innovation and visions for a more connected world. In many ways, this is the perfect way to end my journey along the Silk Road. The Milan Expo is the ultimate manifestation of the exchange of culture and commerce a modern-day equivalent of what took place between East and West all those centuries ago.